Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Brave event. For the greater good, controlling COVID-19 through vaccination. And this is part two of a series we started earlier this year. I'm Calista T.U., Executive Director of the Office of Communication, Marketing and Engagement at Flinders University, and I have the pleasure of hosting this evening's event. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge that while this event is being hosted online, tonight I'm on the lands of the Ghana people, and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We are also being joined by Professor Julie Leaf from the University of Sydney on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, as well as Professor Billy Vineski from Darwin on the lands of the Larapia people. We acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all the nations upon which we are located tonight. So why is tonight's event called Brave? This monthly lecture series is actually named after Captain Matthew Flinders' companion. Many of you may know of the voyage in 1801, where Matthew Flinders' captain circumnavigated and produced the first known map of Australia's coastline. But while Matthew Captain Flinders, widely known and celebrated for his achievements, less is known about his companion, Aboriginal man Bungaree, who was instrumental to the success of this voyage and many others. Bungaree, a Kurungai man from what is now known as the Broken Bay area of New South Wales, was a noted and celebrated community leader and powerful identity. He sailed with Captain Matthew Fingers from 1790 to 1803, role interpreter, guide and navigator. In his diary, Captain Matthew Fingers noted that Bungaree was a worthy and brave fellow who saved the expedition many times. So fast forward then to 1966, when the then founding Vice Chancellor of Flinders University, Professor Peter Carmel, stated his vision for the university, of which he said, we will experiment and experiment bravely. So it is in the spirit of this tradition and in acknowledging Bungaree that we recognise the very roots of Flinders University. I'd also like to thank Bank SA, who is the presenting partner of this lecture series and this special edition tonight. Earlier this year, Jonathan Craig, Professor and Vice President of the College of Medicine and, and um, Public Health at Flinders University, along with Associate Professor Jill Carr and Professor Paul Ward, presented the first of this um, series, For the Greater Good. That time, Australia was in the primary stages of its COVID-19 vaccination rollout with a seismic shift expected in its fight against the global pandemic. Professor Craig and the panel discussed the behaviour of the COVID-19 virus, findings from the vaccine trials, compliance issues, and logistics of vaccinating a population across Australia, and importantly, how we can manage vaccine hesitancy. Have you had yours? I'm due for my second next week. Tonight's event continues that theme with four experts whose knowledge and insights aim to provide a framework that enables the community to make informed decisions about their vaccination journey. Today, we are fortunate to be hearing from Flinders experts, as I mentioned, Professor Jonathan Craig, Associate Professor Jill Carr, Professor Billy Bineski, and Professor Julie Leesk, who is joining us from the University of Sydney. As always, we're keen to make this as interactive as possible. So on the screen now, you should be able to see um, the details where you can log on to Slido, either through your browser or use the, um, the QR code, which we're all very familiar with these days, to log in and post your questions or vote for questions you really want to be asked. But I do need to say and reiterate that this session has been put together to provide factual information. It does no way um, supersede the advice of our public health authorities, the federal and state governments, and also your own medical advisor. 
So it is now my pleasure to invite Associate Professor Jill Carr, microbiologist and specialist in infectious diseases and virus research to begin this presentation. Jill has 25 years expertise in studying viruses in the laboratory, including through the peak of the HIV epidemic. Jill has a team working on a current NHMRC funded grant to investigate the interaction of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in the lung to determine how best to manage adverse lung responses that contribute to COVID-19 disease. Jill will discuss the virology aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, including the topical discussion of the impact of variants of concern on our vaccine efficacy. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, uh, Callista, and uh, very pleased to be part of Flinders and part of this uh, presentation. Oops, I've got a miss already and that, thank you, back to my starting slide. So uh, I'm a virologist. I am gonna be talking about the variants of concern, which are you know, all the, the topic in the press. Uh, but just to put things in context for all the presentations today, we are still pace, uh, facing what has really been a ruthless pandemic. Uh, 189 million cases, 4 million deaths, and so far 3.6 uh, billion uh, vaccine doses administered, which is a, an enormous uh, effort. Um, sorry, I'm just going to... Pressing the wrong thing. Now we're good. Uh, and Billy is going to talk later about risk. On the uh, right-hand side there, you'll see two graphs. The top one is the deaths per 100,000 uh, cases. And you can see there's quite a diversity because of course those case numbers that I just talked about then are not uh, uh, uniformly uh, distributed globally. Um, so for instance, the risk uh, in the US is 185 uh, um, deaths per 100,000 people, which is pretty high. And the bottom um, graph there, and again, those yellow dots re represent different countries is the case fatality rate and again that's quite different depending on what country you're in from 0.5 percent to over 10 percent case fatality and as an example there I've got written in the US the case fatality rate is around 1.8 percent and of course we all know that uh, COVID-19 uh, the disease caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory uh, disease um, and what is less uh, well accepted uh, in the general public is that there is also significant other complications. So for instance, thrombotic events, and these are uh, said to occur in about 50% of hospitalizations. So they can have quite a significant impact on, uh, on outcomes. Uh, another thing that is coming to the fore and, and is, a, is a real thing is this long COVID in uh, the COVID survivors. And this is just one example of a review that I've put up that state more than 50 long-term and persistent uh, effects in COVID-19 survivors. And in the graph on the right-hand side, you can see that there's things such as fatigue, uh, headache, uh, you know, neurological disorders, which in themselves don't sound uh, terribly threatening, but these can be quite debilitating and, and certainly prevent people from getting back to their, their normal routines. Uh, and quite alarmingly, this can occur in uh, up to 80% of all COVID-19 patients, regardless of your age, regardless of how severe your initial disease uh, is. And just to highlight the impact that we expect this is going to have as a future health challenge, uh, there's a 1.15 billion investment from the US government to the NIH to, to research this over the next uh, four years. So certainly uh, you don't want to get COVID-19 uh, and uh, Jonathan's going to talk more about the impact of uh, vaccination on COVID-19 uh, as well. Uh, I've just put this up and it's just as a snapshot to allude to that. This is data from the John Hopkins uh, website uh, of cases in uh, Israel where they do have a very good vaccine coverage. And you can clearly see in the top panel in the red, the cases coming down uh, and the deaths coming down in the white as the vaccine rollout in the green line uh, turns out. And so this really highlights to us that COVID-19 vaccination certainly reduces viral transmission and certainly reduces COVID-19 related deaths. But what I'm really talking about here is about the viral uh, variants, and I'm sure you've all uh, heard of these. Uh, and I'll just remind you, I don't want to digress too far into this con conversation, but uh, the, the press really talk about, you know, the, um, uh, the, the deadly, uh, highly transmissible, rapidly spreadly, spreading vaccine, var um, vaccine variant, viral variants. And I'll just remind you that all SARS-CoV-2, all viruses uh, here are, are highly transmissible and deadly. And our public health measures, our um, washing the hands, the physical distancing, the wearing of the masks are, are good public health measures against all these uh, viral variants. 
So why do they occur? It's not unusual that we get viral variants with, uh, with any viruses. And what I've got here at the top, there is an image of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. Uh, and on that uh, gray bar in the middle, the IRF1B, that's the polymerase for the virus. And what this is, it's the copier for when the virus replicates, that it copies the viral genome. And it makes mistakes when it does this. And it has a proofreading capacity that usually fixes these mistakes. But sometimes that proofreader doesn't do its job properly. Uh, and those mistakes get incorporated into the final viral uh, genome and this will create a viral variant. And those viral variants are, are sometimes defective. That's the, that they're not, not infectious. Sometimes they have no effect on the virus at all. And sometimes they have a fitness advantage. That means that that virus can have a benefit when it's out in the community and can outgrow all the others in a particular setting to become the dominant virus that we see. And we see lots of viral variants, and we've certainly heard about them uh, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, because there have been enormous numbers of infections and helps, hence there's an enormous opportunity for the virus to vary. And the second factor there is that we're actually looking. So in the last uh, few years, we've seen a huge boom in our technology to be able to sequence, um, uh, for instance, viruses. And so we've been able to actually sequence, so for instance, in South Australia, every genome that comes into SA pathology. And so that's reassuring that as a global scientific community, we've got a capacity to monitor these, these viral variants. And this is quite a busy slide, but it's a really uh, good uh, website. It uh, is a database that uh, has collated all the uh, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants that we've sequenced so far. And it's based on a, a system that was set up to establish uh, to, uh, for the surveillance of influenza. And what you can see here is along the bottom line is time. Uh, and this is a phylogenetic genetic tree. The individual dots represent individual viral variants and the colors have grouped them into uh, the different uh, variants that we've assigned different names. And as you can see uh, by the arrow, the Delta variant uh, arose fairly on in the, um, pan early on in the pandemic. And it wasn't until really recently that it has really become uh, quite prominent. And if we look uh, where we are now uh, in that box, we can still see that there's lots of the blue dots, those alpha uh, variants and beta variants. We can still see that there's a lot of the delta variant that's uh, around. So this is a continually moving, um, moving thing. Um, importantly, some of those variants we call variants of concern. And what we're really concerned about is that the virus may change its capacity for transmission or its capacity for disease severity. And this is really difficult to delineate in a pandemic uh, setting because there's so many contributors to those uh, functions and not only the virus, uh, virus genome. It's very hard to delineate what changes are due to the virus and what's due to uh, a change in practice and behaviour. But uh, I put up this data, which was from a, a well-controlled study that looked at transmission between people who are in quarantine in China uh, in the green bars at the start of the uh, pandemic in 2020. Uh, and then uh, we saw that there's roughly a six day a time lapse between somebody uh, encountering the virus and becoming PCR positive. Whereas for 2021 with the Delta variant, uh, that time frame was reduced down to about three and a half days. And so it wasn't really, it's not really evident from this what this means. We might think that that's quite terrifying, that that means the virus is transmitting a lot more rapidly, but it also might be quite a positive thing that it might reduce the time for asymptomatic spread. The other thing that came out of this study is they also found a higher viral load in the nose of uh, people who had the Delta variant. And again, what this really means for transmission is, is not really clear. It might mean that it's more likely to spread because you've got more virus in the nose. It might mean that it's less likely to spread because you're uh, not coughing up so much virus out of the lung. It might mean that you're less likely to have severe disease because you haven't got so much virus in the lung. So interpreting all this data is something of, a, again, a moving a target and a continuum. Oh, goodness, I pressed the wrong button again. Sorry, guys. Okay, but what I think is the real important thing of these uh, variants of concern is their impact on vaccine uh, efficacy. And again, I've got that image of the SARS-CoV-2 genome where in yellow is the spike or the S protein, and this is the antigen that's used in uh, most vaccines. And so we can look at the sequence and we can see that particular changes and variants in this S protein and particular parts of the S protein are the ones that we might be concerned about as a potential for evading our vaccine or our uh, protective immune responses. And we can um, measure these immune responses in the lab. And so this just gives you an idea of what we can do as, as one part of the uh, immune response, the neutralizing antibody. Uh, and on the 
right hand side is neutralizing ability so a higher number is better and along the horizontal axis and in colors are uh, different uh, variants of concern and as you can see there for the delta variant in the green bar it has a slight reduction compared to the original virus in the gray bar on the far left hand side um, but importantly, it's still good neutralizing efficacy. It's still well above that LOD, that limit of detection and baseline of our assay. And second factor to always remember as well is that neutralizing antibody is only half the story when we think of our immune response, and particularly when we're thinking of cross-reactive, cross-protective uh, responses that uh, don't vary so much. We can also look at um, data that tells us about efficacy in real life and in the community. And this is probably a better measure than what we can do in the lab. And this is just uh, one particular um, publication, which uh, you'll see from down the bottom, it's not peer reviewed uh, yet. We have an enormous amount of data that comes out quite quickly. But the suggestion from that study is that um, we still have effective protection against the Delta variant and the Alpha variant. Um, and we still have, and this study was out of 12,000 cases in the UK, so quite a big study. And there still was no difference between the efficacy of the Pfizer BNT uh, vaccine compared to the AstraZeneca. And so that's really uh, quite encouraging. So what do I think is the future for our variants of concern and their impact on vaccination? I think we can certainly expect that there's going to be continual uh, evolution or emergence of different variants and some variants of concern. And we can monitor this and make predictions about what they might do to our, our vaccine efficacy. And so that's really important. I think we can be comforted that at present our vaccines are effective against the variants of concern that we're seeing circulating globally. But it may be that we may need a secondary vaccine or some sort of booster strategy in the future. And how far in that future it is, um, we, we really don't know at this stage. But again, reassuringly, uh, we can know that uh, some uh, scientists and companies are preparing for this when we need it. So for example, I've got two press releases, one from February and one uh, just recently in July from uh, Pfizer, uh, who are working towards, again, second generation mRNA vaccine uh, and assessing a third booster strategy and their effective, uh, effectiveness against these variants of concern. So thank you. I'll leave, leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jill. I appreciate that um, we've got speakers from uh, four, five, six different locations online tonight. So we're all using um, new technology, um, but you did wonderfully. Thank you very much, Jill. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Jonathan Craig. Jonathan Craig is a clinical epidemiologist and the Vice President and Executive Dean of Flinders College of Medicine and Public Health, a past member of the World Health Organization Expert Review Panel on Global Public Health Strategy. Jonathan's many current advisory roles include member of the National Health and Medical Research Council's Health Translation Advisory Committee, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, Medical Services Advisory Committee, and Commonwealth Department of Health Life Savings Drug Program. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Callista, and it's a real uh, honor and privilege to be uh, with you all again. So these are the questions that I hope to cover and the brief time that we have together, and it's all around the benefits and adverse effects of vaccination. Why does the health advice keep changing? How effective are the AZ and Pfizer vaccines for preventing COVID-19? Is one more effective than the other? What happens when the dose interval for AZ is shortened? Does vaccination prevent transmission? What's the risk of this TTS thing with AstraZeneca and can a mixed vaccination schedule be used? So we're focusing on AstraZeneca and Pfizer in a recognition that there are lots of other vaccines that are um, available in the world, but at present in the Australian context, there are two approved for use. So firstly, why does the health advice keep changing? So the virus keeps changing and I th think Jill has done a fabulous uh, job in describing why that is. Uh, unlike a lot of health conditions which are relatively stable, the thing with SARS-CoV-2 is that the virus keeps changing and as a consequence uh, the health advice needs changing. The risk of disease in population groups keeps changing. So the scenario that we found ourselves in South Australia in the last week is a very different scenario than 
than a week or two weeks ago. That which is being faced in New South Wales and Victoria, again, is different to what they had experienced. And so, as we'll see later from uh, Billy and, and Julie, the risk of disease is one of the important considerations in the changing health advice. The evidence about the vaccines is absolutely exploding. Um, uh, and again, for some of the reasons that that uh, Jill has explained, that we're not in a stable situation of evidence. Uh, the, the amount of new data that's occurring uh, virtually every day is bewildering. I'm sure some of you like me, uh, sometimes are just tired of the news. We don't want to watch the news. We don't want to watch the Twitter feed. We don't want to watch. We just want to cocoon ourselves because there is just so much data. We've probably entered a bit of a data overload as a consumer, but as a, a policy maker or a health practitioner, this is a very positive thing. In fact, the fact that we have changing health advice in response to these changes which are occurring in the environment is actually a healthy situation to be in. We would not want to have health advice that is static in the face of a rapidly moving pandemic. However, of course, it does create uncertainty. None of us like uncertainty. We want a stable uh, source of truth. But in, that, in this context, uh, where, where things are rapidly evolving, that's actually not that helpful. So to give you an example, uh, Callista mentioned that this is part B. Uh, we gave a talk at, in early July, just some four minutes, some four months ago. At that time, there were around 447 clinical trials of vaccines. In that time, four months, the number of clinical trials has nearly doubled. This is really absolutely extraordinary compared to uh, other branches of health and medicine. We've gone from three to 20 plus so-called phase four real world trials. So phase three, when we randomize people to one or another, in phase four, this is something that it can occur at a whole of country, whole of city or region area, which tells us when the vaccine is rolled out in the real world, what's the effect. So now instead of having information for tens of thousands of people, which say, for example, might inform a new treatment for heart attacks, we now have information that is literally uh, millions of people uh, informing this uh, decision-making process, which is really uh, fabulous because it makes uh, the process more robust, but it does mean that we're getting lots and lots of new information. So the World Health Organization summary in early February suggested there were 74 vaccines in clinical development, uh, 182 in preclinical development. Now that number has again exploded, so there's something like 108 vaccines in clinical development, 11 different types of vaccines. Just in the last 24 hours, I've been uh, made aware that there are early phase trials of uh, a local Adelaide Flinders based vaccine. So let's come to these four questions. How effective are they? Is one more effective than the other? What happens when the dose interval is shortened? And can vaccination prevent transmission? This slide I showed uh, back in March, and this is the, the pivotal trial of the Pfizer vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine that, as you know, is widely uh, being used, particularly in younger people. In the, in the graph on the right-hand side, this is what happens to those who are randomized to placebo. And uh, on the uh, uh, X horizontal, the, sorry, the vertical axis is uh, how many cases of serious infection occurred. On the, on the X axis or the horizontal axis is the time. And that what you can see in red uh, is the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine. And you can see that very early on, by say day 12, those curves separate. So up to about 10 days, that's how long it takes for the Pfizer vaccine to be effective. 
um, and the effectiveness is around 82%. So after just a single dose of Pfizer, after about 10 days, they, it will prevent the serious disease in about 80%. But a second dose increases that number from around 82% to 94%, a smaller but important difference. However, uh, uh, we have to be aware of the play of chance. In other words, if we did this study lots and lots of times, could we be confident that 90, 95% is the real value? Well, actually, it could be as low as 90% or as high as 98%, but in vaccine effectiveness terms, this is really um, uh, uh, incredibly high. What about uh, the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine. Now, again, I showed these data back in March. The story with AstraZeneca is a little bit more complex, which we're not going to go into here. What you can see is a table which demonstrates what the vaccine efficacy is depending on the dose interval, i.e. if you wait six weeks uh, after the first dose or six to eight weeks, nine to 11, or uh, as currently recommended, more than uh, 12 weeks. And you can see that the, the um, effectiveness of the vaccine does go up as the dose interval between the first and the second one increases. You can see that also in the graph uh, at the bottom right hand side, both in terms of the efficacy in terms of preventing disease, but also the, that neutralizing antibody against the spike uh, protein that uh, Jill mentioned before. However, we do not have a head-to-head -head trial that compares Astra with Pfizer. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, as you'd be well aware, that somehow Astra is quote unquote inferior to Pfizer. We don't actually, we're not confident about that because there's not been a head-to-head -head trial of one versus the other, and the settings for those two uh, trials are very different. Well, as I mentioned before, we were now in a really privileged position of having these so-called phase four trials. So uh, this is a whole of Israel study. Israel is an exemplar in terms of its vaccine rollout. As demonstrated in this graph, it began in uh, December 2020. The graph demonstrates the number of infections that have occurred from uh, back in December through to April. And you can see in the top right hand section that around 60% of 16 to 41 year olds are fully vaccinated, increasing to around 90% of those who are over 65, collectively around 70% in both men and women. What was the effect of rolling out the Pfizer vaccine? Well, uh, there's um, the simple version on the left-hand side and the more complex version on the right-hand side for those who, of you who are numbers geeks. But effectively, uh, what this shows is that, yeah, that um, the, the vaccine prevented between around 92 to 90% of, of the illness which uh, SARS-CoV-2 causes. So we know that it might cause asymptomatic disease, it might cause symptomatic disease, it might lead to hospitalization. Sometimes that hospitalization is so bad that people need to go into ICU and unfortunately some people even died. But what this slide shows is that irrespective of whether it's symptomatic disease or asymptomatic disease, importantly, uh, the Pfizer vaccine, when rolled out at a population level, was remarkably effective, consistent with what we found in the trial. Note that it's not 100%, right? Nothing we ever uh, use in medicine is 100% effective, but uh, between 92 and 97% is remarkably uh, effective and as good as anything else we use. Here's a whole of Scotland uh, study, which might appeal to our uh, vice chancellor. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, on the top graph, demonstrate uh, the, uh, the vaccine uptake according to ages, so that by February uh, 15, um, about 80% of those people who are over 80 
had been vaccinated compared to a much, a much smaller proportion of the younger age group. The bottom right hand graph demonstrates that this was a combination of both Pfizer uh, and uh, AstraZeneca. On the left hand graph, you can see what the number of hospitals uh, admissions due to COVID-19 has been over time with that black line demonstrates uh, when the vaccine rollout started and the two blue lines when the uh, various lockdowns were instituted. What was the overall effect? Note with a single dose, a single dose of the Pfizer mRNA or the first dose of the AZ vaccine in terms of preventing COVID admission. And we see again here a remarkably effective vaccine response at a population level of preventing COVID admission by about 90% for both. So that we've talked about most of those questions, but now what is this risk of TTS with AstraZeneca? Firstly, a bit of a summary about what this condition actually is in a few technical terms just to unpack in a bit more detail. Thrombosis is just a technical term for a clot. Uh, when we cut ourselves shaving or, uh, or, or um, on the footy field or whatever, uh, we bleed. That stops because we've got natural uh, clotting mechanisms in the blood. Um, and those clotting mechanisms are due to, th in part, due to things called platelets, which are some of the blood cells which bind together. So a thrombosis occurs, it's another name for a clot in a blood vessel. TTS related to AstraZeneca, the, the special thing is it occurs in an unusual location. Um, uh, for some people who get a uh, AstraZeneca that produce this antibody, the platelets get activated, which combines. This is associated with two viral vectors. So what is the risk of TTS? Uh, according to the Therapeutic Goods Administration and ATAGI, which you've heard a lot about, ATAGI is the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunization. You can see that it varies based upon age. So the rate Either you can standardize per 100,000 or you can uh, one per a certain number. You can see that it varies between one and 30,000 people who are under, uh, under 50 or those who are 80, around one in 56,000. So this to date, that's, uh, there are 83 cases from about 4.5, 5.4 million doses as Jill uh, demonstrated before. This compares the total uh, COVID uh, load of around 32,000. Takes about on average 12, th 12 days to happen. Of those OD3 cases, the majority did not require treatment in ICU. So that is, they weren't that serious compared to at present, we have 29 people in uh, ICU due to COVID-19. Total of three deaths and across the entire pandemic in Australia, we've had 915 uh, COVID-related deaths. So this is a very, very low risk. Uh, just to emphasize that every intervention has adverse events. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the heuristics, but um, overall, we don't comprehend very low risk easily. And we also put more weight on events that happen now than in the future. So I'm looking forward to uh, Billy's comments. This is a, a, a graph which demonstrates the total number of cases of COVID uh, in ICU over time, showing that at, at the moment we've got about 29. Thank Finally, can a mixed vaccination schedule be used? In short, there is very little data around mixing and matching. There is one big study, which is this, which randomized people to not having a booster with AZ or having a booster with Pfizer. The anti, there was a good antibody response, but we don't know what would happen if they got a, a second dose of AZ. We don't also have population benefits, which is why it's not recommended in Australia to date. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Now, um, we've got about 
just over 300 uh, people from around Australia and a couple from Asia actually tuning in for this presentation. It's very rich in detail. We are running a little bit behind. We have booked this session until 6.30. We'll try and keep it as short as we can because um, there's already a number of questions coming in through Slido. So please bear with us. Um, I think it is a really rich and interesting topic. So many thanks, Jonathan. Now we've all seen how public health has been the key driver in keeping us all safe during this pandemic. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker live from Darwin, Professor Billy Bineski, Professor of Public Health. <laughs> Billy joined Flinders University earlier this year as the discipline group lead of public health and discipline lead of public health. So very much public health focus. She's a behavioural scientist and a public health researcher of international reputation. She is passionate about using research evidence to tackle chronic disease and health inequities. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Callista. I'll do my best um, not to go over time. And, and hello from Larrakia land. I'm very happy to be joining you from one of our top end uh, Flinders campuses in Darwin. Uh, so as Jill has outlined, COVID-19 is caused by a virus and vaccination is a key public health intervention to prevent uh, virus infection, transmission and severe disease. In Australia, we have two vaccines available, the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccines. And as described by Jonathan, both vaccines are very effective at protecting people from severe illness following COVID-19 infection. In Australia, the Therapeutic Goods Administration or TGA is a group of independent medical experts and they have examined all the data relating to both vaccines and found them to be safe and effective and have approved their use. Um, in addition for vaccines, there's the other group of um, independent experts, the, advisor, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisations or ATAGI, who advised the Minister of Health on how to administer those vaccines in Australia. And they've made uh, a number of recommendations for both Pfizer and, and AstraZeneca. And I'll run through how uh, risk benefits risk-benefit assessments are made to help make decisions about vaccination. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll start with a little bit of a discussion about risk. And risk in this context is the probability of a side effect or an unwanted outcome occurring and the severity of the resulting harm to the individual all medicines and vaccines carry some risk of unintended consequences and the severity of the harm is an important consideration. So, for example, if I was to say that there was a one in 10 chance of a headache due to vaccine, you might feel differently about that risk than if you were told that you had a one in 10 chance of dying. So as a result, risk is not only a number or percentage, but it's how you feel about it due to how the unwanted outcome might affect you personally, making it very subjective. And the risk benefit analysis is what benefit does the vaccine offer you in preventing disease? And to work that out, you need to consider your chances of getting sick from COVID-19 and you weigh those benefits uh, against risks of experiencing uh, side effects if you do have the vaccine. So as, as we mentioned, um, Every medicine and every vaccine uh, carries risk of side effects. And let's let's consider the risks of vaccines first in this uh, benefit risk um, assessment. For both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines, mild common side effects include headache and flu-like symptoms and sore, sore arms, for example, and they usually pass within a couple of days. It's important to note that some people might be allergic to the vaccine ingredients and these should be checked as well. With the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, as Jonathan mentioned, thrombosis with uh, thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS is the most serious 
uh, adverse event reported. This is a rare condition involving serious blood clots. Um, and there are a number of other rare side effects that the TGA continues to investigate because the timing of the sim symptoms suggests that they might be linked to the vaccine, but they haven't been confirmed and are still declared as suspected uh, by the TGA at this stage. And for the Pfizer vaccine, the TGA has received a number of cases of suspected myocarditis my carditis and pericarditis, which are being investigated. Both the European and US TGA equivalent bodies have recently concluded that these can occur following vaccination, but it is very rare. So in, in summary, um, in Australia, from about 10 million COVID vaccine doses administered so far, and more than half of those have been the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, the total number of cases of the blood clotting disorder, TTS, is 83. And sadly, this includes three deaths. But overall, it means that this disorder continues to be an extremely rare event. So now let's consider the potential ben benefits of vaccination. We know the, the main benefit of vaccination is protection against COVID-19. And the latest Australian data shows that there's been over 32,000 cases of COVID-19, including, as, as Jonathan mentioned, 914 deaths. And there are other poor outcomes due to COVID-19, including hospitalisations, admission to intensive care unit, and a syndrome referred to as long COVID that uh, Jill uh, described a little bit earlier. And this is where it may take weeks or months to fully recover from COVID symptoms. Uh, to provide some immediate context within the Australian situation of, of the current outbreak in a, in a number of states. We, we currently have over 1,300 cases of COVID, 128 of those people are hospitalised, 21 of those are in, in intensive care unit, seven require ventilation, and unfortunately there's been five deaths so far uh, due to COVID-19 during this current uh, outbreak. And um, the potential benefits of vaccination can change according to how likely you are to be exposed to the virus. And this is highly influenced by whether there's an outbreak near you and how likely you are to have poor outcomes if you are exposed to the virus. And this is affected by your age and also any underlying health conditions. It's important to consider data that includes both the risks and the benefits of vaccination. And ATAGI have created the next three data tables to help people easily weigh up those risks and benefits of vaccination with the AstraZeneca in three different scenarios of low, medium and high risk of infection from COVID. Now, in this first um, table, the assumption is made of low risk of exposure to COVID-19. And low risk is defined as something similar to the first wave of COVID-19 in Australia last year. And that's about 29 COVID cases per 100, uh, 100,000 people. And the pink column on the left shows the risk of vaccination. And this is the rate of TTS per 100 dose, 100,000 doses of AstraZeneca and by age. And you can see that the 40 to 49 age group and the 50 to 59 age groups have the highest rates of TTS risk. And alternatively, in the blue columns, you can see the benefits of vaccination represented as how many lives will be saved and how many ICU and hospitalizations are prevented due to the AstraZeneca vaccination. This table shows that the benefits of vaccination increase with older age groups. Now in the second table, 
um, it makes the assumption of a medium risk of exposure to COVID-19. And this scenario is similar to that experienced in, uh, in the Melbourne outbreak last year, which was about 275 infections per 100,000 people, and, and probably similar to or, or what we're approaching um, with the current outbreak in Australia in, in places like Sydney. So here you can see that once exposure risk to COVID increases, the benefits of vaccination dramatically improve and improve for younger age groups also. So for example, in the 40 to 49 year, year old group, the AZ vaccine may carry the risk of five cases of TTS per 100,000 people, but it also presents the benefits of 16 hospitalizations pre, uh, prevented and more than two of those which might be intensive care unit um, admissions. And then the final um, table from ATAGI shows the risks and benefits during a really high risk scenario of exposure to COVID-19, like that that was experienced in Europe this year, where they had three and a half thousand COVID infections per 100,000 people. And as you can see, while the risk of TTS hasn't changed in any of these three scenarios, the benefits are substantially different depending on risk of exposure to COVID and the age group. So as a result um, of conducting this type of risk benefit analyses, uh, ATAGI have made the recommendation that people aged over 60 years um, where the um, should receive AstraZeneca uh, vaccination because the benefits of AstraZeneca vaccination are highest um, while both Pfizer and AstraZeneca can be pr provided for people aged 18 to 59. Pfizer is preferred for these age groups. And in the context of a COVID-19 outbreak where the supply of Pfizer is constrained, adults are younger than 60 years old who did not have immediate access to Pfizer should reassess the benefits to them from being vaccinated with AstraZeneca versus the very rare risk of the serious side effect of, of TTS. So I'm nearly done. Um, in conclusion, we have two vaccines to protect us against serious illness and death due to um, COVID-19 in Australia. And, and there are some common mild side effects, but the serious side effects are very rare. Assessments of risks and benefits need to be considered and discussed for individual circumstances like age and, and potential exposure to, to COVID and then reassessment of those risks and benefits require, is required uh, when circumstances change, like during outbreaks. And there's some um, very good information um, from ATAGI uh, that you can find on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Billy. Look, um, I know we're only flashing up the slide with the information links uh, very briefly, but uh, we will be posting those links on our Brave event site. So tomorrow morning after this lecture, these slides as well as those information resources will be available. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next live speaker from the University of Sydney, Professor Julie Leask. Julie Leask is a professor and social scientist at the University of Sydney. Her research over some nearly 25 years has focused on the social and behavioural aspects of immunisation, that is what people think and do about it, programs and policies. Julie currently chairs the World Health Organization's Working Group on Measuring Behavioural and Social Drivers of Vaccinations and sits on several other World Health Organization immunisation committees. She is a visiting fellow at the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance and was the overall winner of the 2019 Australian Financial Review Women of Influence Top 100. Thank you very much, Julie. Over to you. Thanks very much, Callista, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation, Jonathan. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Darug country in Sydney and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. 
And I'm going to be talking about the kind of human factors here, the vaccine decision making, um, and helping you to think through what all of this might mean for you and for your conversations with others. So making quality decisions for yourself and helping others to make decisions. And uh, I want to start with the fact that um, there are very different positions that people have on vaccination. It's not pro or anti. Um, there's a spectrum of views from the people who are against vaccination and, and are actually activists in that way to those who are simply not wanting to have a vaccine, among whom there might be some who are, will never vaccinate against COVID. Then there are the hesitant who are unsure, sitting on the fence, the accepting who are ready to vaccinate, the demanding who want one now, uh, they're at the front of the queue, and the advocates of vaccination. Your microphone's on. <laughs> um, now this is data from the ABS that shows uh, the vaccine intention. So the bars on the left, are uh, the um, people who disagree or are saying, no, I won't have a COVID vaccine when it becomes available and it's recommended. The people in the middle are the kind of neutral, neither agree nor disagree group. And the people on the right are um, agreeing that they will have a vaccine. So as you can see from December through to June, which are the, the different colored bars, there was a bit of a dip in intentions to vaccinate but it's come back up and recovered. And, and that group on the right, the 73.4% includes those who are have already vaccinated in the more recent periods and those who plan to. So uh, in a way, that's a good thing. But we do also know that there are specific quest questions and concerns people have right now about vaccination. And you might identify with one some of these questions and concerns. People who are over 60, in particular, previously over 50, where that um, Pfizer was not preferred, so the AstraZeneca vaccine was the only one available to them, uh, are wanting a choice. They're upset they don't have a choice of vaccine, particularly if they don't want to have the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a handful of people. Um, there are people who are concerned about COVID um, and really torn about the risks and benefits. There are people who are concerned about the common side effects, taking time off from work. There's issues around whether the vaccines are effective against variants, and you've already heard a lot of evidence around that, um, and they're looking pretty damn good. Um, there's vaccine, vaccine interactions with pre-existing conditions that people are worried about, and the risk of TTS, which is preventing about 10% of people right now, an estimated, um, having a vaccine, they're waiting for Pfizer. And uh, there are concerns about mRNA element of um, the Pfizer vaccine and later for us, the Moderna. So let's think about making quality decisions. And a quality decision um, generally might look like this in very crude terms, um, asking yourself, what's being recommended for me right now? And that's understandably a bit confusing, but your state or territory health department should be the best place to go and your health professional. What disease is pre being prevented? You've already heard about COVID, long COVID, um, acute COVID and the sorts of risks there. Um, what are my options? Do I want to vaccinate now? So my options are vaccinate now, um, bring even my second dose earlier, which is what we were asked to do in New South Wales if we had a first dose of AstraZeneca from 12 weeks through to eight weeks because of the importance of having a second dose now in an outbreak context. Um, that There might be the option to wait for some people until a Pfizer vaccine is available. And some people are considering the option to not vaccinate at all which is of course um, what you saw in that data from the ABS around 11% at the moment. What are the benefits and harms of each option? And what do I value? What's important to me in this decision-making? And uh, this is Michelle Steele, who's um, on the Nacho website and is talking about COVID-19 vaccination, particularly uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. 
And uh, we know that thinking about elders, protecting them, protecting community and family is a very important uh, consideration for Aboriginal peoples. So uh, what about weighing those clinical probabilities? Well, you've already heard about this from Billy and I'm not gonna go into it again, except to say this information is available to you if you are simply to Google weighing the risks and benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine um, because of this TTS issue. And uh, for clinicians, the Ask CRE um, group at the University of Sydney, led by Lyndall Trevina, have produced this quick tool as a decision support tool, which goes through what's being involved, what are those options, as I said, the contraindications, uh, all the precautions, and then what are the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the dot diagrams at the top, the icon arrays, and what are the side effects? And the tiny red dot at the bottom right in that picture, if you can see it, is the, um, the where they're expressing the risk from very rare side effects, including TTS. So it's less than one in 100,000. And in fact, as we know with TTS, it's between one and four per 100,000, depending on your age group. The um, options then, if you if you think about it as a seesaw, which is the image I have in mind at the moment, um, on the side of not vaccinating now, it might be you're concerned about serious side effects, which is fair enough. Um, we should respect that. You might be worried about the side effects um, and you might um, find getting a vaccine very inconvenient for various reasons. On the other side, we're looking at the COVID-19 impacts, which you've heard about, the idea of protecting others, which is very important for people, of contributing to the health of society and of reducing the impact of COVID that you're feeling acutely right now, particularly in South Australia as you adapt to a new lockdown. Um, Alan Cheng, the chair of ATAGI, um, put it like this. Um, there's some topics you may want to discuss. What's your risk of getting COVID, your personal circumstances, your medical history? Do you live with elderly parents? What risk are you willing to take? What is TTS and what should, you should look out for? Uh, and in, in making our decisions, it's, it's useful to be aware of the mental shortcuts we take when we're thinking about risk, such as the tendency to overestimate low probability outcomes, compression, or the weighing of rare serious outcomes when they're highly available to our memories and vivid. Anticipated regret at, the, um, at the, the feelings we'll have if we take a particular course of action. Emission bias, which is accepting a higher risk from doing nothing than a lower risk from taking an action. And ambiguity aversion, where we avoid a risk when the outcome is uncertain. It can work either way with vaccination, of course, because there's risks on vaccinating and there's risks for not vaccinating. Um, I had my AstraZeneca vaccine when it was still recommended for the 50 to 59 year old age group. And uh, I did it. This is a personal decision. It's different for everybody. But for me, I was grateful we had a vaccine. I wanted to walk the talk because I've been talking a lot about it publicly. Uh, I trusted my colleagues in ATAGI I accepted the fact that there is a trade-off. I accepted that there was a risk, but thought about the fact that 99,998 people out of 100,000 who have the AstraZeneca vaccine don't have TTS. And I, um, I was also conversant with what to look out for. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to be quite snappy with um, this slide, but it's just to run through the different things that motivate other people to vaccinate as shown by research, perceived risk, confidence in the safety of vaccines, trust, desire to protect others, role models is very important, trust in government and healthcare provider recommendations are extremely powerful uh, and vaccinations being inconvenient, uh, we can never underestimate. So when we're talking to others about vaccination, particularly, say, for example, if we're advocates, we, it's always worth asking yourself, who am I talking to? Where are they at with vaccination? To do that, listen, acknowledge their concerns, 
um, address their, their information needs, um, look at some of the advice around debunking if they are believing some of the misinformation, act as a role model, respect their choices, and keep the conversation going. And it's also to, okay to recommend vaccination if you'd like to see that person vaccinated, but it all should, always should do, be done in a respectful way. I want to broaden it out just briefly to finish off by saying it's not just the motivation, it's not just the way we think and feel and the social processes that influence vaccination. It's also the practical issues and they can account for a large proportion of people who don't vaccinate. So where we must talk about vaccine uptake, not just hesitancy, although that is an issue as well. And in terms of uptake, here are the sorts of things that improve uptake from reminding people to have a vaccine through to providing on-site vaccination, multiple interventions at a community level, um, and then a pos policy level requirements that are implemented ethically and well justified, incentives work, and reducing any kind of out-of-pocket cost also works. So right through that social ecological model, um, there are things that are important. It takes a village to vaccinate one person. Uh, so in finishing, I want to acknowledge my colleagues in the collaboration on social science and immunisation and point you to this article that we recently published in the Medical Journal of Australia, particularly looking at communicating with patients and the public about COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you. Many thanks, Julie. That was a really interesting and um, personally interesting presentation that you just gave. So thank you. Now, look, we're just closing on six o'clock. We were meant to close at six o'clock. We've been flooded with questions online. So with uh, your permission, I'd like to take 15 minutes to have at least a couple of them which have rated very highly with our online audience and have those answered. Then what we'll do is with the, um, the remaining of the questions, we will look to compile those over the next 24 hours and post those on our uh, Brave event website. Uh, but in starting, um, one of the questions which actually you can vote on Slido, one of the really highly voted questions is, I'm not sure who in the panel will be able to answer this, but is, does a vaccination have um, an effect on fertility and pregnancy? So I'm going to hand over to our panel. Is that something, Julie, you might be able to answer? Uh, so the, the, the shorter answer is no. Uh, it, the COVID-19 vaccine does not affect fertility. Um, and it originally was recommended only for pregnant women who uh, were at particular risk, but now that's changed. And uh, it's routinely recommended uh, by the um, Royal Australasian College of um, Obstetricians and Gynaecologists for all pregnant women. Um, there's enough data now on pregnant women from hundreds of millions of doses being given and uh, it's uh, safe and well tolerated for pregnant women and worth doing because of the risks of COVID for pregnant women. Okay. Can I hop much. in next, Alyssa? Uh, sorry, this is Jill. Can I hop in there, Callista, that uh, there's often a bit of misinformation when we talk about sterilising immunity and it's got nothing to do with sterilising people. It's about having immunity which absolutely negates a total infection and that term is used in the scientific literature and I think it can get misconstrued in the public as well. Uh, thank you. Very important point. Another question we've got here, um, is there an evidence-based uh, is there evidence-based current approaches to counselling vaccine hesitancy? Now, is that something Billy or Jill, you might be able to respond to? We've done a lot of work in this area, uh, including producing the sharing knowledge about immunisation um, resources uh, that you can you can just Google SKAI. Uh, so. There is, and in fact, motivational interviewing is particularly appropriate for most vaccine decisions when there's a recommended uh, vaccine and community benefit from vaccinating wear. So there's a more desired behaviour um, and it involves um, working with people's own barriers and concerns about vaccination, 
validating them and then um, drawing out their own potential motivation to vaccinate and amplifying that. And uh, we've actually developed a package of guidance and tips for clinicians to use these approaches with um, parents making decisions about child vaccination. But with COVID-19 AstraZeneca vaccine in particular, because there's this risk of TTS that is, um, you know, it's like one to two and a hundred thousand, it's a serious outcome if it happens, then we think more towards a more shared decision-making model is appropriate there. So you can just sort of move between different models depending on um, the vaccine and its um, urgency. And another question which is, um, I guess, really at the heart of this whole session is, how can the risk versus benefits of vaccination messaging get through to the general public with all of the media messaging and all of the news articles that are out there to those people in the general public, and I include myself as one of those not having a medico background, who actually don't have an understanding of epidemiology or public health? So I think it's probably at the heart of each of our panellists. Jonathan, have you got a comment on that? Um, so uh, thanks, Callista. Uh, so what I would say is that, um, so we have the underlying fundamentals, which is that the vaccine, all the vaccines that are in widespread use are very, very effective, actually remarkably effective. Um, and then the complexity, as I mentioned before, is that how that's applied to individuals and groups of people really changes over time. So, so I think it's, uh, and I'd be interested in Julie's views here, but intuitively people understand that uh, for something like a bad disease like cancer, where the outcomes are going to be very poor, untreated, people would tolerate uh, sometimes treatments which are very nasty because it makes sense because their underlying disease is nasty and so they're prepared to, to trade off uh, nasty complications for a good outcome. So the, the notion that actually people make adjustments based upon what their underlying risk is is intuitively obvious. People who don't have cancer would clearly not take kindly to recommendations by uh, medical or health professionals to subject themselves to nasty chemotherapy, right? They just, so I think people understand uh, intuitively that actually these, the, 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 as Julie said, that seesaw does vary, but I think what is particularly helpful from the information that ATAGI and the other sources they've put out is really quantifying that risks and benefits. It's the quantification that does add complexity, which is why those decision tools have been provided. Thank you, Jonathan. Any other comments from the panel? Otherwise, I'll go to our next question, which is um, what, and I think, um, I think Jill, maybe you touched on this one earlier in your presentation, but what actually causes the COVID-19 um, to change, virus to change? Uh, so it's a natural thing that the, the virus does, and many RNA viruses do when it replicates its genome, the genome uh, replicating machinery, the polymerase is not perfect, it makes mistakes. And sometimes that gets so it's a, a purely random event and then when you have all those variants out there in the community it's uh, you know it's a darwinian kind of uh, um, emergence of the, the fittest so it's a, a random event um, then you can have selective pressures and for instance our vaccination program is eventually going to be a selection pressure for emerging viral variants and that's why we need to monitor them Okay, thank you. And look, I think I'll throw to our last question now before closing. Um, and look, I don't know if anyone on the panel knows the answer to this first part of the question, which is when will the Moderna and Novavax vaccines arrive in Australia? The, but the second part's interesting. In terms of blood clots, are they better than AstraZeneca or Pfizer? 
My my understanding is that the Moderna is on order for next year. So whether they'll arrive next year or not, I'm not sure. Um, I I is don't know whether. They... Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, Billy, I spoke over you. Is there any evidence in relation to their blood clots versus what we have in Australia already? I don't know whether Jonathan's looked at um, the evidence for the Madonna and TTS or other forms of blood clots. So um, the the issue, well, J Julie can speak, but uh, these are particular issues uh, with respect to the, um, they're not mRNA related problems. So the Moderna is an mRNA vaccine. And so uh, TTS is not a problem with the Moderna vaccine. But I think Julie was going to say something. Yeah, um, there's no causal link established between um, the mRNA vaccines, i.e. Moderna and Pfizer, and TTS. It's the AstraZeneca vaccine and the other adenovector virus vaccines that appear to stimulate this immune pathway to the clotting and low platelets. Uh, and, um, and that means that it affects both the um, AstraZeneca, which is available here in Australia in very rare instances, as you've heard, and also the Janssen vaccine, which is the same platform. Okay, thank you, Julie. Now, look, before we close, does any of the panel have a final comment or uh, a takeaway point for our, our viewers online? I might say a couple of things, if I might, which is, and, and I'm surprised this question hasn't come up, which is what, what proportion of the population need to be vaccinated before we get herd immunity and life as we know it is kind of going to go back to somewhat approaching normal? Uh, this is a function of two things, how infectious the, the virus is. So for Delta, we will need more. And then the question is, uh, and all, the second element is um, how, how good are the viral vaccines? So what we, what we know, is, uh, uh, best guess is at least 80%, right? Now, uh, the, the country that is done most best in this regard at Israel, which is up to 60% having both uh, doses. Uh, but what we can see here was 60%. That's probably not enough because they are now starting to have an increase in their cases. Mm -hmm. In Australia, as, an, as context, uh, overall, it's about 13 to 14% of the population is immunized. It varies to some extent. The territory's best at 24%, WA 11%, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales around 13 to 40%. So there's a long way uh, that mm -hmm. needs to, to go before we even approach, um, if you like, safe population levels of vaccination. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Sure. Julie. Uh, just a really big picture statement from Dr. Tedros, from uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization. No one is safe until everyone is safe. And that means that the sooner we get all people in all countries vaccinated, um, the more control we'll have over COVID and the emergence of new variants. So um, let's keep thinking about ourselves as a nation, but also thinking about being advocates for uh, um, timely vaccination supply to low and middle income countries where some countries don't even have vaccines that have started yet. Yeah, that's a very good point. And any comments from you, Billy, from Darwin? No, I think that um, the Julie's point was a very important one to finish with. Okay. Jonathan, did I just see you put your hand up? I, I, I was agreeing with Julie. I think that's a really a critical statement. Yeah, it is. And, and Jill, anything from you in closing? Uh, no, I was going to agree with uh, Julie's comment, you know, the, and the arising of the variants of concern, the more replication there is overseas, we will see more variants. And so we do have to control it in um, many of those resource poor settings before we can all, uh, all be uh, safe as well. Totally agree. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for those closing comments. So we have run slightly over time um, and out of time, but I think that the topics that we did cover and a couple of those questions at the end, I hope you found worthwhile staying on that extra 15 minutes. Thank you to Jill, Jonathan, Billy and Julie for sharing your time and your knowledge. I really recognise that it's not the hour that you're online here, but it's the time you go into putting into something of this scale so that our broader community can have um, some information Information. So I'd like to also thank our audience for attending online and also for your questions. If you miss some of it, the um, video will be able to be viewed tomorrow on our Flinders YouTube channel and also on our Flinders University Brave Events channel. And as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of questions which were outstanding, so we will look to post those and some um, and some responses, noting again that disclaimer that it's not to replace any medical health advice that you might receive. Thank you once again, and please stay safe and well. We wish you all the best from Flinders University. Thank you.